All right, but another big talking point is the future of English football, and, and Gary's been right at the heart of that. So we thought we'd take the advantage while he was here to uh, take some views on Project Big Picture. Am I semi-retired or something? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's here. <laughs> it feels like it sometimes. <laughs> right, this was Project Big Picture in a nutshell. The proposal, which was dreamt up, well, depends who you believe, but Liverpool and Manchester United were right at the heart of it, weren't they? And the idea was to give the more established clubs more control of the running of the Premier League in return for one or two things, including providing greater funding to the EFL. They would uh, pay an initial £250 million bailout to cover Covid losses, which the clubs are absolutely desperate for. The Premier League would then be reduced to 18 teams with two automatic relegation places. Parachute payments would come to an end. There would be an end also to the Carabao Cup and Community Shield. But Premier League clubs rejected the proposal on October the 14th. So does that mean, Gary, that that project big picture is dead in the water? Can we leave those things up there on the, on the screen, if that's possible, just so we can refer we can, to them? We can put so them you don't have to look up. at my face. <laughs> or your hair. Eh? Or my hair, yeah, my hair's <laughs> been criticised tonight, which is a regular thing. No, I mean, look, for me, Project Big Picture isn't acceptable. It's not acceptable to, I don't think, any of the 72 clubs in the EFL, probably. And it's not acceptable to certainly the 14 clubs in the Premier League. Based on purely, I would say, mainly number one there at the top. The idea that the most established clubs, the top six, run English football isn't palatable. It's, it's not a goer. No one can accept that. You can't put the hands of English football into, in, 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 in the in the grasp of what would be Roman Abramovich, Daniel Levy, the Glazer family, J.W. Henry, um, etc. So that, that's never going to happen. So that's the one that will never get Project Big Picture through. Number two, to me, what that means is there that the Premier League accept that the EFL do need £250 million bailout, but actually they're saying that until if you don't accept Big Picture, you're not going to get your £250 million. But the release is there an acceptance. Dropping parachute payments... I'm happy with 18 clubs. I haven't got an, I haven't got that big of a problem with the, the fairer distribution of the wealth in the game by the money from the two clubs and the parachute payments going to the general EFL. I'm massively supportive of because along with cost control of salary and salary cap, it makes I think most EFL clubs sustainable. There's no need to drop the community shield. Fit it in on a Wednesday. Fit it in on a Thursday, like they do with the Super Cup. It raises money for charity, for goodness sake. Don't get rid of it. It's silly. Just compromise on that point. The Carabao Cup, yeah, I think it could be reshaped. Why couldn't it be something that's part in pre-season, part in the first few weeks of the season? To me, it's not a competition that needs to be lost because ultimately I think you can do different things with it. Um, so for me, Project Big Picture, when it came forward, having been part of the, the, the group that I was part of, which was asking for an independent regulator... I welcomed Project Big Picture coming forward, not because I supported it, because there was an acceptance from clubs and from the EFL and from the FA, and we'll come on to the FA, the FA in a minute, Greg Clark, who's been part of this all the way through, who's now trying to distance himself from it, the worst of the lot. He's neither pleasing one side nor the other, right? Is that If the FA chairman, the EFL chairman, and six clubs in the Premier League have come together to create what would be a new proposition for English football, there at least is an acceptance that the current situation is not acceptable. There isn't anybody in English football, whether it be the fans, the EFL, non-league clubs, National League, the Premier League clubs, the, um, the FA, basically no, no one's happy with the current predicament. So what Big Picture did was put onto the table the fact that there is a debate now to be had about what football, English football does in the future. To me, it wasn't acceptable, but at least it's being discussed. At least it's on the table. There's an acceptance. There needs to be a fair distribution of wealth across the game. Fans need a better deal. You know, part of Project Big Picture was that the away fans' price would go from £30 to £20. Who's not in favour of that? Everybody's in favour of that. So there's parts of it actually you could vote for, parts of it you couldn't uh, negotiate. We'll come on to that. We'll come on to that. But you say it wasn't acceptable, but for a lot of the fans and a lot of the, the press reports, it was, there was outcry, wasn't there, no, about well, this? Dave, on, my, Why do you think that was the my, case? My view of what happened, quite simply, Project Big Picture came out on a Sunday. The 14 Premier League clubs obviously have been blindsided by their own members. So that's the problem they've got to take internally. We all know what happens. Some of those 14 clubs get onto the mates in the media 
and you either have to come out with a press report within 24 hours because of the immediacy of it, I hate it or I love it. And it was basically lambasted across the board for being a power grab by the big six, because that's the big point at the top, which none of us can accept. What, it should have, what should have happened is that, yes, maybe the six clubs and the EFL should have introduced it in a different way. It shouldn't have been leaked. It should have been presented properly and, 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 and done behind the scenes, but that's not happened. What I believe the reaction should have been to Project Big Picture was, whoa, let's hang on a minute here. There's a proposal come forward. We don't like some of it. In fact, we can't even begin to think to vote for it. But actually, there are bits in there that we really like. And actually, we're willing to debate around a major issue, which is we've got to distribute the wealth further across grassroots, non-league, EFL. Fans have got to get a better deal. Simple as that. It was on the table to debate. What the Premier League then did a few days later, when you say they rejected it, is they unanimously rejected it, but then... I think the most important part of that statement was they agreed to work together to create a new strategic review of English football. That's all I really wanted to hear because it needs reviewing quickly. What did you make of it, Jamie? Um, there's a lot of talk about the power grab of, of the big six, but Liverpool and Manchester United were, were right at the heart of that. And there did seem to be some suggestion that they had frustrations about their power at the top table and their voting power and their power at deciding the way forward for the Premier League when, as we'd all probably accept, they are the biggest clubs, they have the most fans, more people watch their games than, than others. Did they have a point? I can understand a little bit of the frustration from the top teams where everyone's got an equal vote and everyone should have an equal vote. And that frustration may be coming from the fact that whether you like it or not, the top clubs do drive the revenue coming into the Premier League and they're there every year and there's teams coming up and down. And one of the reasons they get their 100 million is because of maybe, obviously the Premier League, but also, you know, the big clubs and they drive that. But I agree with everything that Gary said, uh, really. One thing that I don't like about Liverpool and Manchester United, and maybe, I don't know, I'm not sure if I'd feel differently if... if if David Moores was still involved at Liverpool or it was, it was David Gill or Martin Edwards, there's something about... They're both owned by American ownership who, who want to make a few quid. <laughs> we know that when they come in, we know that they will sell at some stage and they're trying to sort of change English football and give those clubs more power, not because they necessarily want more power so Liverpool are more successful or United in probably 30 years' time. It's probably getting more money when they, when they sell. But what I wanted to say is they've took a lot of criticism the top clubs, namely Liverpool and Man Manchester United. And as Gary says, a lot of the stuff was good and a lot of it wasn't. So, rightly so, took a lot of criticism. What I didn't like was the hypocrisy of it, of all these other clubs in the Premier League then saying, oh, the, you know, the top six looking after themselves doing this. Are we forgetting restart? When the bottom six clubs or the bottom ten didn't want the league to go on. Karen Brady was talking about null and void because it suited them. This idea that people in football were all going to look after each other with this football family, it's nonsense. It's never been that way and it never will. It never will. So everyone will do what's best for them. Liverpool and Man United will do what's best for them. If the EFL want money, we'll give you money, but we want loads back in return. Yeah? As I said before, the bottom six clubs, we don't want to carry on. Let's finish the season relegation. The EFL now needs help. Don't get me wrong, who wants to see a club go out of business? But you know, Wigan in the summer, when they were going out of business, or nearly going out of business... EFL clubs are raiding them, their academy, getting everyone on the cheap. Who was caring about Wigan then? Or maybe Berry have gone bust. So everyone in a situation will always look after themselves. And the thing that you're involved in in uh, Save the Game type of thing, everything you say, no one would ever disagree with it. I just don't see how it's functioning, how it can work, and, and how that independent regulator could make well, decisions for other, other people and they'd accept that. It seems the opportune time then to, to talk about the... the the, the project that Gary's been involved with, which is our beautiful game. This, Gary, is one of the eight people on this um, the group that released this manifesto to reform football. And, and as JB says, the, the main point of this was to pro propose the creation of an independent regulatory body for running the English game, to create a new and comprehensive licensing system, reviewing the financial stresses, including the parachute payments and the salary caps, of which League One and League Two already operate under, 
Um, they want to implement governance reforms at the FA to ensure of its independence and diversity, liaise with fans, groups and champion fan involvement in the running of clubs, studying successful models from abroad. <coughs> it seems right at the heart of this, Gary, is, is giving football almost back to the masses. Dave, what Cara's just said there about the fact that ultimately, you know, whether it be Karen Brady and West Ham or whoever it was voting against football restarting for self-interest or whether it be the top six trying to put a power grab on it or whether it be other groups within the actual football fraternity always thinking about themselves, the fan generally loses. Um, and the reality is the fan has got to... It, there's got to be a, a greater accessi accessibility to football and it's got to become more affordable. I think all the general interests of each body in football can be looked after because there is enough wealth in the game. I think we can have the most amazing Premier League in the world still and distribute the wealth down through the game. I think the EFL can be a competitive um, part of the pyramid where we can have more sustainability with cost control in place and the uh, wealth being distributed through it. I think the National League can get more money in terms of non-league football. I think the FA and grassroots can be supported far great, in a far more... Uh, invested in more so that it can look after basically facilities and coaching and all the other educational elements of it. I think the players can still get paid handsomely as they do obviously today. I think fans can still have a more affordable... Um, uh, experience on a match day when you go to watch no, a football match. How could so, so, it change? So I, I genuinely believe that. So if you take the pure view, who grew up as a football person at the age of five or six that fell in love with the game could disagree with what I've just said? You can't, you can't. No one would. Who would not distribute it more if they felt that we could still achieve all those things? So what an independent regulator does, appointed by the government, and that could be a, a committee of people who have the best interest of the game at heart, is just look at balance and fairness to achieve the goals of the things that we've just mentioned so that actually that self-interest that Jamie refers to through the Premier League or whether it be through other factions of football are just able to be brought back to what would be a simple... No, that doesn't work. So I'll give you an example. £14.95. That doesn't work. Mr Regulator says, no, you're not doing that. That doesn't work. It doesn't work for the fan. It's not fair at this moment in time. We're going to stop it. That's one example. So for me, those five or six aims, which I think look after all the key stakeholders, create sustainability in the game, distribute the wealth more across the game, can be achieved with the money that's in the game. We spend two or three hundred million pounds a year in agents. We spent 1.24 billion pounds in a transfer window in the middle of a pandemic. And there are going to be clubs going bust in the next two months in this country through no fault of their own because they've got no revenue coming into them. That cannot be right. It cannot be right. So for me, the self-interest that exists, which I, I form part of, I've profited from the, from the Premier League, I'm an EFL owner, I've been part of the PFA union, I've represented the FA with England, all those different groups that I've represented, I like them all. They're all great as far as I'm concerned because I've worked within them. But they all look after themselves. Let's try and somehow coordinate it so that there is an element of independence looking at those bodies and saying, I can give you what you want, but they're going to have a little bit more over there. They're going to need a little bit more over there. Oh, and by the way, we're going to take it a little bit more off you because that's the way it's going to work. And it's there's still enough to go around. I want to come back to you on a couple of the, the what look like sticking points right now. On the 14.95 that, that Gary raises, I mean, Mike Ashley this evening, the Newcastle owner, has, has called for it to be £4.95. Um, there is a meeting of Premier League clubs tomorrow, and you'd have to imagine that this is, is pretty high on the agenda, wouldn't you, Jamie? Yes, but I think it's laughable that uh, it's Mike Ashley who's come out and said that. I think he's still taking season ticket money of Newcastle fans. I mean, the fact he's come out and said it... Listen, I can't disagree with what he said, but... I, uh, I mean, for Mike Ashley to come out and say it probably shows how messed up it is, actually, in some ways. That what Gary's just mentioned and you, you know, the 14.95, it's gone down like a lead balloon, obviously. I'm sure it will change or... It, it just needs scrapping. At all. It just needs scrapping. Just get rid of it. It's gone. It's finished. No one's paying it. No one's watching it. It's done. It's finished. Get rid of it. It's certainly incredibly controversial. Um, one of the sticking points that uh, I want to discuss is, is the... This bailout money that the EFL clubs, as you well know, are absolutely desperate for. And as you said, one or two are, are pretty close to oblivion, it would, it would seem right now. There also seems a willingness from the Premier League clubs to give money to the League One and Two clubs that really need it most. With conditions. With conditions. Why with conditions? But the problem is that for me, the Premier League, the Premier League is seen as this sort of like business. It's not, Premier League isn't 20 clubs that basically the same every single year. Sunderland, Ipswich, Norwich... 
Nottingham, all these clubs have been part of the Premier League at certain times. Next year, there'll be three different clubs in the Premier League than there were this year. This is a transient set of clubs. There's 92 members of the football pyramid in this country, all of which can take part in the Premier League. All of which. There is no ownership of the Premier League in terms of permanence. So the idea that it's this business that sort of what would be, they need to control the money for themselves. Yeah, there are some, there are six or seven, eight members that have always been there, nine members. Well, let me finish but my everyone point. else moves out of that league at some point. Let me finish my point, because it does seem like, uh, I think Steve Parrish made this point in a newspaper column, that why would you give money to potential competition, potential rivals? And one of the sticking points that I was talking about was the fact that it feels like Premier League clubs are not really willing to bail out championship owners, many of whom are arguably as wealthy as they are, in some cases wealthier, and are also spending up to the hills right now in terms of wages, while League One and League but Two Dave, clubs the of, have the sorted out their houses. Dave, the structure, there's a couple of things there. The structure, of, the structure of payments to football clubs in this country is ridiculous. It's wrong. Six, seven million quid to number 21 in the football pyramid, 100 million to number 20. If you had a shorter gap between number 21 and 20, which is the top of the championship to the bottom of the Premier League, you wouldn't have this desperation to chase this money. You wouldn't have this desperation that exists. So just basically, let's accept that that gap shouldn't be as big as it is. I think Steve Parrish has made a lot of very good points and he's, I think he's, to be fair, a good football operator. I thought actually he was the biggest single factor in the restart happening in the article that he wrote partway through it. But the idea that those clubs in there look upon it as their money that they're handing to Stoke because Stoke have basically got an owner that's worth six billion or eight billion. Stoke have been in the Premier League longer than most a lot of clubs that are in there. They've been an incredible asset to the Premier League under Tony Pulis. They've got every right to earn money as much money out of the English football pyramid as a Crystal Palace who've been out of the Premier League for a number of years. Newcastle have been out of the Premier League. Sunderland are out of the Premier League at the moment. Middlesbrough are out of the Premier League. This, this is not a sort of what would be a, a mafia. A closed shop. A closed shop that basically it's their money. It's not their money. In 1992, they did a deal with English football to break away on the basis. They would pass that money down fairly through the pyramid. So it's not, what we're talking here is about redressing the balance of where that money goes and the share of the money that goes to different places. And who cannot want fans to get a better deal if you grew up supporting football? Who cannot want sustainable clubs in the EFL and clubs not to go bust? Who cannot want footballers to have that dream when you're a kid to be able to do well and, and play football and earn good money? Who cannot want a Premier League that's the best in the world, that basically wants to be watched by everybody, that we see the best managers and best players? Those things can all be achieved. It's not a case of, if we don't give them £100 million for the bottom club, it all falls off the edge of a cliff. It doesn't. It doesn't. Because clubs in La Liga, in Serie A, and in the Bundesliga, have far less money across the board and still have comp comp competition with us in Champions League and beat us hands down some years. So it's not a case of we'll, everything will just fall off the edge of, the, of a cliff if all of a sudden we maybe go to 80 million to the bottom of the Premier League and 20 million to the top of the Championship. It's not going to fall off the edge of a cliff because of that. How, how realistic do you, do you think it is that, you know, obviously the group that you've been part of, I think Andy Burnham's part of it, David Bernstein, how, how realistic, everything you've said there, I don't think anyone watching at home, us sitting here could ever disagree with anything that you've just said, but how realistic is it that someone could, an independent regulator, make decisions for other people within the Premier League, Steve Parrish, different clubs, every club, if you like. It, is it realistic? It, it's great, and we'd all like it to happen, but... Is it realistic to happen? To be honest with you, the absolute preference of the group of eight people that have come together to ask for an independent regulator is that football reforms itself. That big picture is reshaped in the next few weeks and those five or six key components of looking after the fans, looking after non-league, looking after grassroots in the FA, looking after the EFL clubs and making them sustainable and maintaining the Premier League as the best in the world. If football could reform itself and prove that it could do something it's not done for 30 years, then I think, to be fair, the eight people within that group would happily fade away. They're not there with any motive other than to try and redress the balance and introduce a fairness to English football. Is it football. your understanding how these conversations are happening right now? Yeah, no, I don't know if they're happening at Premier League level. My point is... The, the, well, the I'm thinking if they're not happening no, now, they, when, when is the money well, going to get to the EFL well, clubs? But Dave, that's the issue. I've been shouting for, for, on the football show every single day for eight months. How can the Premier League not put a package in place out of the unbelievable amounts of money that are still in the game for the EFL clubs. Forget Stoke, 
Think about Barrow or Grimsby or Harrogate or Fleetwood or Accrington. Don't think about Stoke just because they've got a rich owner. Think about the actual approach that, yeah, you hand some money down and there are going to be some wealthy owners that might get it. But actually, mo all the clubs need the money to be able to re retain sustainability. And sometimes people may look at me and think, well, at Salford, why are you asking for money from the Premier League? I don't want the Premier League's money. I'm not personally interested in it. I want the game to be looked after more. So coming back to it, how big a challenge is it going to be? Yeah, a massive challenge. A massive challenge. Introducing a private member's bill in Parliament or getting specific government support, it's going to be, it's going to be really difficult because the government tend not to want to try and get involved in industry. But they do in energy, they do in broadcasting, they have an independent regulator. Football is so important to the fabric of this country, the communities within this country. I've called for many years for the government to intervene. If it doesn't intervene now at this point where clubs are on the brink of extinction because of a self-interested group of clubs or group of entities that won't hand some money down to them without conditions, without further uh, putting them into debt, without further embargoing the transfers and things like that that are happening, then ultimately I lose faith in the game that we all love. I lose faith in it. So if Salford, and I suspect it might be your ambition to take Salford into the Premier League, if that was the case, would you, would, would Peter Lim be happy to pass money down the pyramid? Dave, this summer... I voted for salary cap. It goes against everything that Salford have done for the last five or six years because it was right for the league. I voted for the end of the season. We, we had the money to continue and wanted to continue because we felt we might be able to get into the playoffs. Dave, at Salford, we have voted and we will continue to vote what is right for football. Ask any League Two owner. I've been on every single call for the last seven months. Ask every single one of them the way in which I voted on behalf of Salford City. Don't Salford City will do the right thing. And this suggestion that I'm asking for an extra 200 grand, 300 grand from the Premier League clubs, I couldn't care less about it. I want football to redress the balance. And I wanted that before I owned Salford City, and I want it beyond that. Peter Lim doesn't vote for Salford City. We do. We run the club in this country. So from my point of view, Peter Lim invests in our club because he chooses to invest in any other club. We put money into our football club. We've done it for five, six years now. We love what we do. But you asked the League Two owners where we voted in the last three, four, five months. We voted on the right side of football every single time. Is there not a part of you, though, that, that, that thinks maybe the Premier League owners, if you spoke to them individually, would share your concerns, share your views. It's just finding well, that collective agreement say, because of this, if, this if, self-interest. For me, ultimately. if you're a football, if, if you're a person who owns a football club, there are some football club owners who have bought it for investment. There are some football club owners who have bought it because it's a, a trophy. But the majority of football club owners have got involved because they love it. If you go back to being that kid that grew up loving football, how can you not want the things that we spoke about before as being the five or six really important things that need to occur in English football? Who doesn't think that a fan deserves a better deal? Who doesn't think that the FA should be investing so it can provide grassroots facilities for every community in this country? Who doesn't think that? If you, you've got to be mad. You've got to be, a, you've got to be an enemy of the, of the game to not think these things. The money's there. It's there to do. So just do it. Do the right thing. And at this moment in time, it's not helped by the fact that we've got a government who won't vote for kids to have free school meals in a holiday. <laughs> so if the fact of the matter is, you can look at all these different elements of society, self-interest, it's nonsense. Do the right thing. Well, maybe they're having these conversations this very evening. There's, of course, a, a big Premier League meeting tomorrow. and We wait to see what comes out of that as well. Gary, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, thank you as well. Thanks. I'll do my hair next time. <laughs>